Moving forward, Diana White is our next presenter. Diana is a mathematical biologist and assistant professor at Clarkson University. Her research focuses on problems that are at the interface between mathematics and biology. She recently started modeling biological invasions in her very own backyard. She's developing a model to study the growth, spread, and biological control of invasive water milfoil, an invasive aquatic plant that spread through much of the US. The test site she is looking at is at Norwood Lake, a small reservoir located along the Racket River in upstate New York. So Diana, if you're there, you can take it away. Thank you very much for that introduction. And thank you guys for having me here. Um, if you guys hear some screaming, that's probably my toddler. Um, it's in that time, and so I hope that this goes well. She's watching TV now, so she's content. All right, I'll try to share my screen here. Maybe someone can give me the thumbs up if you can see it. Um, can you guys see this? Yeah, perfect. Okay. Um, so, so I've been coming to these types of um, conferences for the last couple of years, and every time I, I say I'm a, a mathematician, I do tend to scare some people, but um, what I hope um, that many of you will kind of take away from this is, is that um, we sort of need mathematicians and we need statisticians to, to help understand problems in, in watershed management because there's so much data being collected. We need to you know, be able to interpret that data um, and say meaningful things. And, and also as a mathematician, potentially build predictive models to predict how these systems are going to evolve so that um, in, in my case, help with controlling um, invasive species. Um, okay. So today I will talk to you about some work that I've been doing, um, looking at sustainable approaches for controlling invasive, invasive Eurasian water milfoil. Um, many of you here probably have heard about um, water milfoil. There are native varieties um, and there are many invasive varieties, especially up here in upstate New York. Um, the two particular types of milfoil um, that we're sort of focusing on is the Eurasian water milfoil, which you can see up here in that kind of top picture. And then also the variable leaf water milfoil, which is um, a water milfoil that is native to most of the southern places um, in the US, but up here in Northern New York, it's, it's invasive. It's, it's only been found probably the last uh, 20 years. And in Norwood Lake, it's uh, the type of milfoil that's more pervasive. Um, so Eurasian water milfoil, not a whole lot, but variable leaf water milfoil, um, we have tons of it. So, if you had to sort of rank how, how much of an issue um, this particular aquatic invasive is, um, it probably ranks um, among the top three invasive aquatics throughout the, throughout the U US um, and in Northern Canada as well. Um, it's invasive for a number of different reasons, um, like most invasive plants um, or species. Um, it replicates very, very quickly. Um, it can grow into very dense mats and it, and it forms monocultures. And that basically just means that it kind of pushes out um, all native species. So in lakes that are really heavily infested with it, you will just see a, a blanket and it grows right up to the surface. It forms this thick canopy. And um, it's not just negative for the ecosystem. Anybody who, who has it in their lake knows that, you know, it ties around the motors. It makes boating very difficult. Um, it makes fishing very difficult, um, and it actually reduces, um, I would say, fish abundance as well, just because it's, it's, it's not an ideal um, spawning ground for fish. So there's a lot of negative, both um, ecological, but also, um, I would say, recreation, recreational impacts um, of this particular plant. And one of the most um, I think it's really interesting. It's also very scary. Um, reason why it's very, it's, it's very invasive is because it has sort of three modes of replication. So it has um, a sexual form of reproduction where it forms seeds. Um, it has an asexual form of reproduction. It can grow sort of under the ground like an aspen tree. It forms these long root systems and it can sprout up um, in other parts of the lakes. 
but it can also re uh, reproduce by fragmentation. So small bits can break off and flow downstream and then settle and then that plant becomes viable. So um, that's one of the, the main sort of um, reasons why it can grow so quickly. Um, I probably, I, I didn't hear about this plant before 2016. I, I moved to upstate New York from Canada um, in 2016 and I moved actually onto uh, Norwood Lake, which is about a 15 minute drive from Clarkson University where I work. Um, and the first week that I was living there, I lived out on this little kind of peninsula, I guess. Um, the first week that I was there, I got a uh, message taped to my door that said, come to um, the Norwood Lake Association meeting. We're going to talk about this invasive aquatic. Um, and, and apparently it had been an issue probably for about five, 10 years. Um, and so myself and my husband being mathematical biologists, really interested in studying biological and ecological systems, we were thinking, oh, invasive species, um, we should go and see what this, what this is all about. And sort of that's how it all began, um, working with the local community, applying for some grants, um, getting a grant from the Department of Environmental Conservation, um, and working really as a team with the Norwood Lake Association. They're, they're um, through their volunteers and also through undergraduates that we were able to hire, we were able to do um, quite a bit of work in the last three or four years, as you'll see. So there are a number of different control or management practices that are typically used for this plant. Um, so it's this particular problem is not new and many people have been doing these control, control um, strategies for years, but if you read through the literature, Nothing has worked in the sense that um, it's not sustainable, um, meaning that it's costly or not easy to do um, every single year, every other year. And so it, I, I think it's really important if, you know, this particular plant is growing, you know, in your backyard, um, we need to come up with a sustainable approach because um, the people that are going to be taking care of this problem are, you know, Lake Association members or people in the community. and um, you know, they, they need to be able to afford it and they need to be able to um, implement these practices them, themselves. Um, so some of the control practices that people use, mechanical harvesting, um, some of you may have seen videos. It's basically like a giant lawnmower that goes to the lake and kind of trawls everything up. Of course, um, it's probably not a great idea. These things are really expensive. Um, it picks up everything in the bottom of the lake. So it really destroys the natural habitat. Um, but really one of the main reasons why it's not great for water milfoil is that it's, um, it's kind of clipping like a lawnmower would. So a lot of fragments are displaced and it, it's, it often just makes the problem worse. Those fragments, um, become viable again, and then they just grow back the next year. Herbicides, um, again, it, it can be used in lakes that are fairly infested if there's, you know, no other choice. Um, but we all know that there's, you know, negatives for herbicides. Um, and for Norwood Lake, especially, it's a dammed reservoir, so water is flowing in and water is flowing out. So herbicides are typically washed out very quickly. Um, I won't say much about drawdowns, but if you're on a dammed reservoir, right, a, when work needs to be done on the dam, um, the water is lowered. And oftentimes that can actually just help um, naturally get rid of a lot of the milfoil because it grows in that fairly shallow areas. Um, so the land will be, you know, exposed, especially if it's in the winter for some period of time and it could kill off um, some of the plants, but of course it's killing off native plants. And I wouldn't necessarily say that that would be a sustainable control practice because, you know, it's, it's run, it's not something that individuals can do, right? It's simply if, um, you know, Brookfield needs to do work on the dams and then, then it happens. Um, so we don't typically get a lot of notice when that happens. Um, and then what I'll be talking about is the use of mats. So simply just blocking sunlight um, and, and stunting the growth of the plants. Um, hand harvesting, so carefully picking the plants and making sure that you get the roots as well. Um, and then also the use of a biological control of milfoil weevils. Um, milfoil weevils are a um, specialist for milfoil. So they only eat milfoil, um, 
but for a number of reasons, which I'll explain later, it, it can be quite difficult to do, but if you can do it, it, it can really, I think, lead to sustainable, um, sustainable control programs. Okay. Um, so before I talk about these you know, control and mitigation strategies, I should say, um, as a mathematician and probably as just an ecologist or a biologist, um, I think we should all be aware that before we go in and we sort of alter the ecosystem or do something to it, um, we should probably try to understand how it's, um, it's dynamic sort of in a natural setting. Um, if you don't and you simply maybe just go in and you know, throw a bunch of you know, some, some sort of bug or biocontrol into the system, you, you know, is that bug going to eat something else that's native? What are, what are the repercussions going to be? So you should understand the system um, in a natural setting, probably before you go in and you try to do um, some, some control. Um, so I'm not going to show too much math, um, but I did want to talk a little bit about the math um, because that's what I do. Um, I, I, I'm using mathematics um, to build predictive models to understand first how the plant is growing over time. So um, how much we might you know, see over a season and then also how it's spreading. So from year to year, where can we expect the plant to spread uh, throughout the lake? So local growth and then global spreading of the plant. And so if we're talking about plant growth, um, we can, build a model, and I just I kind of wrote it just in words so it's, it's easy to understand. Um, what we're looking at is looking at a change in plant biomass, and the biomass is increased by plant growth, which can be increased due to an increase in temperature. Um, it depends on things like irradiance, water attenuation, you know, how turbid is the water. Um, and then it's affected but simply by respiration, right, which um, is needed for photosynthesis. So you have um, plant growth and then you have plant decay. And people have actually looked at models and here's my sort of scary, scary equation, but in words, the growth term is simply just a function of temperature, irradiance and turbidity of the water. So you can input those sorts of parameters. And then also if you know about respiration, you can input those parameters and you can get an idea about um, plant, plant biomass over a growing season. And that's what you're seeing, oops, in the picture right down here in the, in the corner. So this is an image that I took from a different um, report, but they were looking at, um, so this particular species is Eurasian water milfoil. What they were doing is they were laying these quadrats um, down in a lake at specific periods in time, pulling up all of the biomass and then drying it and weighing it and then recording the weight over the growing season. So the squares there show the field data and then those smooth lines represent the model output. Um, so in, in this way, I'm trying to show you how a model right, can be compared with experimental data and then potentially be used to make predictions about um, how much the plant will grow, say, you know, a month later. Um, and again, this is not my data and these are not my simulations, but this is the model that we are using and we are collecting parameters from Norwood Lake in order to use this this model um, from Norwood Look to look at biomass change over time for variable leaf water milfoil. Um, and just to also maybe give you an appreciation for sort of um, what you would, how you kind of would interpret the results of say um, a simulation like this to the left or to my left, um, you can see a graph of a simulation of biomass over time where time is in days. So biomass is increasing. And over here on the right, you can see um, the height of the plant over time. And in this particular simulation, uh, the lake is two meters deep. So at 200 centimeters, two meters, um, the plant reaches the surface. So if I ran that model that you saw there on the previous slide with different parameters, it's, it's for a different lake, it's not for Norwood Lake, you can see that you have this sort of constant growth if you're following my mouse, right? Constant growth. So a similar increase in biomass every day. And then at this kink, this is where the plant reaches the surface, it increases. So the, steep, the, the curve here becomes steeper. And you can kind of um, understand why, why that's the case because 
the pictures here show the plant, oops, growing sort of under the water. It's growing at a constant rate every day, but then when it reaches the surface, it piles up, it becomes very dense and it forms this canopy. So it actually, the biomass um, increases at a, at a greater rate once it reaches the surface. So uh, shallower lakes tend to have higher, higher growth rates uh, later on in the season. Um, and this is just to show you some images of what the students are doing on Norwood Lake. So we're trying to kind of replicate the results of that study and use that model, but try to collect, we're trying to collect parameters for Norwood Lake. So our students are, or our students last summer, um, collected data by taking hula hoops and weighing them with um, down with sand and water, and then putting tent pegs in to make sure that they didn't float away, tying little bobbers so they could make sure that they could find them later on in the field season. But they would put six different uh, hoops out each week, and they would use saws to saw around the end, uh, the edges of the hoop, pull all the biomass or the water mill foil out. There was a lot of mud in it as well. Put it in a sample bag and then take it back to the lab to separate right all the other plants and mud. And then they would dry the mill foil and then average it for the six hoops. And they did that every single week. So we could have an understanding of biomass over time for Norwood Lake. Um, and just to show you right over here is what it looks like when the area is, is denuded, right? They, they, they did a pretty good job and they would go back each week um, and they would actually um, look at new shoots that, that's, that came up. And I can talk a little bit about that as well, just to understand not just the growth over time, but to understand how quickly it's um, uh, spreading or growing back into the region. And this is just some um, initial data right, showing biomass um, over time, where 176 is just meaning the 176th day of the year. So we did these from mid-June, no, sorry, beginning of June to um, mid-August, this work. And hope, we're hoping to be able to do this again this summer um, in a different area of the lake. Um, so that's the work that we've done with um, modeling. And I'm just gonna check my time here to make sure that I have enough time. Okay, perfect. Um, to model plant growth, um, to understand biomass over time. Um, and I'll quickly just talk about the spatial aspect of the problem because we really wanna understand not just you know, how a dense patches is growing, but we also want to understand how it's spreading throughout the lake. And so these images here are from, and I, I took this uh, from a paper, Vegetative Spread of Duration Water Mill Foil. Um, so the image over here to the, uh, to my right, uh, or sorry, my left, is an image of, um, it's, it's, it's what we refer to as spread. Um, so if you're looking at the units, it's, meters squared per day it should be written in. So what the individuals did in this study is they um, put a grid system down in a lake, which was meter square. And I'm not sure it was a huge grid system. So what they would do is they would um, look at how, um, how far the the stalins or the underground root system of the plant, so this is not the biomass, would spread throughout the lake um, over, over the course of, and this is from April through to April through to December. So this is in a more Southern area where the milk oil is able to grow almost all year round. So they would look at the, the rate of expansion, stalin expansion. And so this is what we mathematicians refer to as diffusion. How fast is it spreading out? The, radial, the rate of radial expansion. Um, and then over here on my right is a calculation of looking at each grid to see the percentage of the grid that's filled with Stalins over that period of time. And you can see here at the very beginning in April, there's 0% of the grid that's um, filled with you know, that root system. And then as you get to the end of this growing season, it's all the way up to 100. Um, and, and you would expect that, you would expect that, you know, as, as you keep going in time, right, eventually the whole grid area is going to be filled with, with Stalins. And so using images like this, we can calculate this so-called, what we call a diffusion coefficient. And this helps us understand how fast the plant is spreading through space. And then 
This picture here on the right helps us understand what's referred to as the intrinsic growth rate of the Stalin network. So again, these equations, you don't have to really look at them, but there are only two parameters in this type of model that we need. And those parameters can actually be pulled from this type of data, okay? Um, so what we're doing is we're actually trying to figure out these two parameters as well for Norbert Lake. The intrinsic growth rate for the Stalin network should be roughly the same as in other lakes, so we're not too concerned with that. But this spreading rate would certainly change um, because it's heavily dependent on temperature. And just to give you an idea about how we're calculating that spatial spread parameter in our lake is we're simply going back or the students simply went back every single week um, and took images of hoops that they've already denuded. And they would try their best. So again, right, this is, this is kind of like an eyeball technique, so it's not perfect, but they would put little dots there using imaging software of where they would see new shoots come up. And then a couple of weeks later, they'd come back, they'd take another image and these, I'm not sure what the color coding is. It could be from the week previous. And then these yellow dots are likely um, newer, right? Um, shoots, so at, a, at, a, at the next week. So just being able to understand where the shoots are week by week, we can calculate that D in that model. So we can understand the, how, how the plant is spreading spatially throughout the lake. Um, and this is just to show you what the output of a spatial model would look like. Um, so what you see over here on the left, top graph represents biomass. Um, both graphs actually represent biomass. The top graph is, what, is just a, what we call an initial condition. So I just say what it would be at the beginning of the season. And then over here to the right, this is my initial Stalin distribution. So I just plop Stalins down randomly through, throughout a lake, which I'm simulating. Um, so this is like 500 liters by 500 liters. And then we run that model that I just showed you. So we look at the spread and how the Stalins are, are um, spreading through, growing in each grid point and then also spreading through space. So you can get an idea about how the biomass changes in the entire lake and also how the Stalin network changes. And this is really cool. And we haven't really done work with this yet, but I just wanted to highlight with um, a predictive model like this, right? You can predict after how many days, right? What will the biomass for the lake look like? Um, and so this is, this top graph here is saying that at the end of the season, there's gonna be an average of about 21 grams per meter squared biomass, okay? If I'm looking at this top left picture. And then you can do things, fun things like, we'll say at 160 days into the season, let's pull out a big patch here. So this would be like a hand pulling experiment and then keep running the simulation to see what would happen at the end of the season, how much biomass um, we have after we implemented this control strategy. And you can see in the bottom, after we did hand pulling and let the model run again, that you can see it's just over 15 grams per meter squared. So this is just to show you, okay, we did some pulling and it's less, that's great. But of course, this is just a, sim a simulation. Um, we have to figure out what that diffusion coefficient is for Norwood Lake. We have to figure out what that intrinsic growth rate parameter is, and then use this, the dimensions roughly of the lake, for example, um, and make things a little bit more realistic, but it's doable. And that's, that's sort of the goal, what we're trying to do. Okay, so in the last part of my talk, um, and this is kind of, I think, the most exciting part for me, um, it, this, this is work that just recently got um, published in ecological applications, is um, understanding the use of a biocontrol with the Eurasian water milfoil. Um, and like I said before, um, there is a specialist for milfoil. It's called uh, the milfoil weevil. And there's just a little picture here of, of him over here on the right, my right. And what the milfoil weevil does is it lays its egg in the mare stem or the growing end of the Eurasian water milfoil. And then the egg, um, when the it hatches, the larva and the pupa uh, eat the tissue. And so sometimes this kills the plant, um, but usually what it does is it simply just stunts the growth because nutrients can't grow throughout the, the stem of the plant. Um, so um, weevils 
could be a great idea for uh, augmenting lakes as, as a biocontrol for Eurasian water milfoil. And, and this is not a new problem, but I'm gonna tell you what we're, we're doing that makes this, new pro this problem easier to understand. Um, one thing that is important to note about weevils is that um, they do live in the lake in the warmer parts of the season, but in colder parts of the year, they have to overwinter. So there needs to be leaf litter. Um, so there's this whole extra you know, piece to the puzzle that's um, you know, talking about whether or not there is a so-called uh, buffer zone. So an area of shoreline around the lake that can sustain these populations. And so typically lakes that have really big Eurasian water milk well problems, perhaps you won't see um, large buffer zones. Maybe people have you know, mowed their lawns right down to the edges um, and, and, and whatnot. So a lot of this problem is simply just, you know, okay, one thing you can do is simply just create a buffer zone and maybe it won't work, but it, it could only possibly have positive impacts. Um, so like I said, these weevils aren't a novel idea. Um, so if you look at studies dating back to the early, I think 80s, um, I'm not sure when this particular study was completed, but the green there is, um, I think, oh yeah, this, the green is where weevils are found um, naturally. And then those black dots are areas where there has been shown to be a natural decline of Eurasian water milfoil. So there certainly is a correlation, right, where you see these declines in Eurasian water milfoil and, and where you see weevils live. And so because of this study and many other studies that showed similar results, um, a company uh, by the name of EnviroScience, um, and they're still a company, but they don't do weevil augmentations anymore. Um, they caught weevils, raised weevils, and sold them off for ridiculously absurd amounts of money to different lake associations. And this is just a picture of um, some lakes in Ontario for which these studies were done. Um, and they sold them to lake associations, but there was really no method to the madness, I guess. They would just say, here's a thousand weevils, here's 5,000 weevils, um, dump them in your lake. You know, um, you know, when do you put them in your lake? It's the question, how many weevils do you put in your lake? How many times a season should you put them into their lake? Um, and so because of this sort of haphazard way that they did this, they just sold weevils whenever a lake association would want weevils. Um, looking at, uh, all of these studies, and we actually looked at all of these studies, 130 of these studies, it was roughly 50% success and 50% failure. And so there were, there were no real solid yes or no answers to whether weevils would work or not. And so the company stopped selling weevils and, and that was that. But we came back to this problem and we thought, oh, oh okay, wait. So weevils, you know, probably would work, but we sort of maybe need to go back and, and, and quantify or figure out, you know, why certain lakes were successful and why certain lakes were not successful. Um, and so what we did was we performed what's called a metadata analysis, which is simply just, um, you know, collecting from all of these 130 studies that did weevil augmentation, um, information on things that we thought were important, A, for Eurasian water milfoil growth, but also B, for weevil success. So we calculated for all these 130 studies, um, things like the lake size, the lake temperature, the turbidity of the water, secchi depth, lake nutrients, right, phosphorus. Um, and then we also looked at weevil habitat. How long is the shoreline um, that has a buffer zone relative to the total shoreline of the lake? And then we also looked at the weevil augmentation strategy. So how many weevils did you add and how often did you do it? Maybe once a season or twice a season. And so then this is where the mathematics again comes into play. So we knew all of these pieces of information for most of these pieces of information, we had to use some missing data techniques for some of, some of these lakes, but we had all of this information. And then we also had information on which lakes were successful and which lakes weren't. And using this fancy, um, it's, it's not really new, but um, it's, it's newish and maybe some of you have heard of machine learning, but machine learning techniques are simply ways in which um, a computer can work to find connections or patterns between 
So here we have what we call eight model predictors and then the output of success and failure. So the machine learning model can be trained to figure out why certain legs were successful and why certain legs weren't successful. They, it, the machine can figure out those patterns. And after we, we uh, developed this you know, machine learning algorithm, and I just wanna show you sort of these results, what we found was um, pretty interesting. We, we ranked the parameters um, to see which parameters were most important for predicting weevil success. And we found that, um, and I think that this is a, a really nice uh, result, that the buffer zone, so weevil habitat, as well as treatment frequency, how many times you add weevils to a lake, and then also max depth. Um, so here you see 1, 1.7, 2.4. Uh, the lower the number, the, the, mo the more highly ranked the, the so-called parameter is, which means it's, it's most important. So all of these parameters were important for predicting weevil success, but those were the, those were the three um, most highly ranked parameters. Um, and so then the question is, well, what can you do with this model? Um, and first, I should say that we actually did test this model in the sense that, yeah, we built this machine learning algorithm. But then we had um, we we tested it on lakes for which augmentations were done, and we did know the yes or no answer of success or failure. It, and we found that with eighty six percent probability, we were outputting the correct answer of whether or not it would be successful or not, which I think is um, really high and um, really promising. And so, in the last few minutes of this talk. Um, I don't know how many more minutes I have here. Um, what I wanted to talk about is what we're actually doing with this model. So we have this model. And so now what our model can actually do is we can say, okay, go to a lake and calculate those eight parameters. Tell me what, how much phosphorus is in the lake. Tell me the buffer zone. Tell me how deep the lake is. Tell me the surface area of the lake. Um, calculate the Secchi depth. Input that information into our model and then try different augmentation strategies. Throw 5,000 weevils in there twice a summer. Our model will output the probability of success. So if it outputs 0 0.3, that means it's 30% chance weevils will be successful with that augmentation strategy. Um, and so that was really cool. So that, well, I think that this is one of the best things about predictive modeling and using mathematics to try to answer problems is that you can then um, use it to make predictions about the future. But of course, you know, there's probabilities associated with things. We can simply uh, let lake associations use our model and say, well, with about 80%, there's an 80% probability that this augmentation strategy will work. And then they can decide whether or not they want to do it, right, based on um, our recommendations, right? It's not a simple yes or no question, but it certainly provides insight. Um, so, Last summer, we, we were awarded a New York Sea Grant um, in order to run a four credit program. Um, we called it uh, the four credit track of Project World. So water and habitat on the Indian River, protectors of water and habitat on the Indian River Lake, um, which was established in 2019 by the Indian River Lakes Conservancy here in upstate New York um, as a volunteer program in the summer. Um, and we started a pilot project with the Indian River School to run a, um, a class in watershed management. And our goal was, is to right, train tomorrow's watershed leaders. And the pilot project was extremely successful. So the, the goal and, and my goal in this is we're hoping to run this in five schools this summer is to, is to sure, train tomorrow's leaders in watershed management, but to help them appreciate and understand um, both the biological and ecological side of things, but as well understanding the importance and at least appreciate um, how quantitative sciences work, math and stats. Um, you do need nowadays to be able to interpret data. You need at minimum some stats knowledge. And so a lot of people are you know, deterred away from that. And so um, with this project, the students you know, learned a whole lot about math and predictive modeling and, and even about machine learning in general. Um, and they use this model 
on four different lakes, Moon Lake, Butterfield, Grass, and Hickory. Anybody local to the Indian River Lakes know those lakes probably fairly well. And what the high school students did was they went out and they collected all the inputs that we needed for our predictive model. And then they did things like on Google Maps, they looked at down here, this is like a lake, moon lake. The red is showing buffer zone. So they sketched out the buffer zone using Google satellites, which is the area right, that's suitable for weevil habitat. And they input all of that information into our predictive model. And they tried different weevil strategies. So they talked about augmentation. They tried different augmentation frequencies, number of weevils. And the main result was that Moon Lake would be the best candidate for um, weevil augmentation. And that with even a small number, 5,000 weevils, if you augment twice in the season, um, almost 100% probability that, well, that's the model prediction that you will um, reduce your Asian water milfoil within the lake. And um, this project was really successful. They came to Clarkson. They won an award at the end of end of summer research uh, showcase as emerging sustainability scientists, um, and they presented their awards to local stakeholders. Um, and a lot of them are um, talking about how they are interested in in watershed management. And a couple of them are enrolling in um, or applying to schools for um, environmental and um, biology related uh, majors, which is, is kind of exciting. And I should say that one of the mentors for this year's program was a Project World, um, Project World alumna in 2019. So it's, it's interesting to see the feedback mechanism um, of this project such that people, people really love Project World and they, and they keep coming back to it. So, our, our hope is that the project gets bigger and bigger and we can run this in more schools and, and um, yeah, train students from high school and then also in, into undergrad. We have had some undergrad mentors on this project as well. So with that, um, I, I guess I will just simply summarize by um, saying that we're doing a lot of work with um, predictive modeling, looking at growth and spread of Eurasian water milfoil, variable leaf water milfoil, hoping to um, put together a paper within the next year. We, we have a lot of parameters that we need to, and data that we need to sift through from the summer for Norwood Lake. Um, but the, the, the predictive model for weevils is something that um, has recently been accepted to ecological applications. And um, I have a student now working on a what's called a graphical user interface for it. So we can put it on my website and, and lake associations can run the model if they want to. So it'll be open source and it will be easy, um, easy for people with very limited computer experience um, to use. And with that, I will end my presentation and field questions. I have my uh, web, uh, website there as well as my email address if anybody anybody wants to get in contact with me. Thanks, Diana. Um, so I've had a couple questions come in. This is just a friendly reminder to everybody that if you have questions for Diana that you can in, uh, input them through the chat or the Q&A. So the first question that I have for you is um, off of the Project World slides, and that is, are there plans to expand Project World into the St. Lawrence River? Um, so we we are we are looking at expanding Project World to other places within the, within the St. Lawrence watershed, and right now we're looking at five different schools located um, in counties. Uh, well. We're looking at looking at even going all the way from Jefferson to Frank uh, to Franklin, and then a couple of schools in the St. Lawrence area. Norwood School being one of them, Indian River Lakes, um, and hopefully Salmon River. Um, that's kind of still in the works, but we hope, yeah, we hope to expand this this project to more schools. and And the idea would be that it's not just this Weevil project, but every year a different person would introduce some project in which would be related to watershed management and, and tying together quantitative analysis with field work. Um, and that's kind of like the overarching goal of it. But yes, lots of plans. We have, we have funding we're still waiting to hear on. So hopefully it's successful. I'll keep my fingers crossed for you. Um, okay, the next question is, 
Um, it ties in with weevils and it's a two part question. The first bit is, are there local creatures that eat weevils? And the other half of that is, are there environmental costs associated with introducing the weevils? Right, so environmental costs, um, there, there would be really no environmental costs because it is a, uh, a specialist. It only targets milk oil. So with regards to augmentation, there's, um, lit, there's little to no problems, I would say, in augmenting a lake with weevils because they're found locally. They're already in the lake. You're simply augmenting or increasing the population. Um, yes, there are predators. And I'm, I always get this question, um, panfish eat weevils, right? And so one of the things that we tried to do was in, in, the, in the model is we, we wanted to try to identify, and it's, hard, it's impossible to try to, I mean, panfish are everywhere. So the answer is, are panfish in the lakes? The answer would be yes, they're, they're everywhere. Um, but one interesting thing that we would like to do, and I don't know if this is possible through experimental DNA, is to try to maybe incorporate the abundance of panfish in a lake into the model because they are a predator. And it is likely the case in lakes maybe that aren't as successful. It could be the case that is, is because they're, um, are, are more panfish, right? But I cannot conclusively say that, um, but it is, they are a predator. Um, so you would expect more panfish, less weevils. So it's, it's definitely one of the most important things. And that was like part of the discussion of the paper was, we do need to understand a little bit more about panfish um, and, and how much panfish are in each of these lakes and how they contribute to the results of the model. Yeah. Um, I've got one more question for you, and that is, is there a best season or ideal time to manually pull milfoil? Um, I would say yes. Um, we've done a couple of successful pulls. Um, one of them is go pull if you have a drawdown, uh, simply because there's no water, and it's it's actually pretty easy. We I should, I put a video on my website, actually, it's, it's, we call it the carpet method. You can kind of roll up a mat and you can see where the, the roots are and you can pull it out. Um, but in general, there's, there's no drawdowns, right? So I would, I would say probably closer to the end of the season, like late August, early September, um, just because you, there's, you can, you can see where it is. Um, and that's, that, that's really the only reason is, is that people can actually identify it. Um, and it's, it's matted heavily in the shallow regions and people can get on it. And for those of you who want to kind of understand more about pulling it, you just really have to be careful not to fragment it. So if you want to pull it, a lot of people put um, stand around the outside with nets so that they can kind of catch the fragments as people inside are pulling. Um, and a lot of people go on like boogie boards or little floats and kind of like, so they don't make the, you know, the, area too muddy so they can actually still see the milfoil. So if you're good at kind of floating and pulling at the same time, you can you can do that. Okay, um, there are a couple more, but I will send those to you in a different document and then we'll um, put the answers out online right. later. Thanks for your talk, Diana. Thanks for having me. And nice to see you, Lauren. <laughs> yeah, good to see you too. <laughs> good. Diana, thank you very much. Uh, I know that we, uh, some of our volunteers participated in a poll this summer that Lauren organized. So we've got board members and staff and, and a lot of our uh, members and volunteers that are very interested in this project. 